So I'm going to talk about the Hague Abduction Convention as an international human rights issue. And I'm going to start with some of the messages, emails and stories that we receive every single day from mothers who are caught up in this human rights abuse. I've had to change names, partly because mothers will face further abuse from their partners if they go public, but also because in many cases, the courts themselves silence mothers in this regard. And there is a warning, a lot of this content is quite distressing. So, Vicky. Vicky wrote to us last year. She'd fled Ireland and was back home in the US. She sent us screenshots of page after page of violent threats and vicious abuse from her ex-husband. She said, I suffered over 10 years of narcissistic abuse from him. My children's entire life up to the moment we left was filled with toxicity and abuse from their father. Now my ex has filed a hate convention against us. It's very frightening, the thought of my children being shipped back to a country where we have nothing. We have no family, no support. I just know they're going to send my kids back and I'll have to follow. I'm absolutely terrified. What if he kills us? Sarah was returned to Australia from New Zealand after her abusive ex-partner won his hate case against her. New Zealand citizens are not able to claim benefits in Australia, as you probably know and they're not eligible for support. So Sarah's ability to look after her daughter was severely compromised, a fact that jeopardized the custody battle that followed. She told us her story. The legislation, she said, forced me and my two-year-old daughter into homelessness. This law doesn't care about justice. It stripped us of our basic right to have a roof over our heads, favoring the rights of the father, no matter what the consequences for us. Dee was the first Hague mother I ever met. Her story and her endless courage continue to inspire and move me. She wrote, My first escape was when my first baby was born. She was just out of the hospital, having been beaten out of me by her own father, and was premature and tiny. He lost his temper because she cried. He lost his temper because I tried to push him off me when he raped me, just after having a traumatic birth. I held her in my arms by those damned windows and he punched me while I held this tiny precious baby, sending the two of us flying over backwards towards the glass and onto my back. She, thankfully, was okay. Not that he cared. I was not. I waited until he went out to work. I packed a backpack with diapers and wipes and other maternal detrius. I put the baby into a sling across my chest and I took myself out of the country with her. The Hague Convention sent us back. My second escape was soon after I'd been returned from the first, my third a year or so after that. One more precious child followed, then there were three of us trying to escape a man who was bent on destroying us and being helped to do so by patriarchal systems which enabled his abuse. I wrestled with being meaningless as far as any help went. The children perhaps mattered, but I did not. My broken bones, my cuts, my head injuries, my deaf ear, my messed up eye, none of it mattered. I ceased to matter. I was a golem that only existed to protect the children. I have no idea how I made it out of those days with any of me intact. The Hague has defined my entire life and clouded every single day since I first decided that either I ran with the baby or else he was going to continue hitting me, raping me, that he would eventually kill me. I feared he would kill the children too. His blank rages were not something that were controllable or periodic. I lived under a regime of permanent fear. And finally, Cassandra. Cassandra had escaped to Australia from England because she feared being killed by her children's father, a man who had sexually assaulted and abused her. She told police, he said he was going to chop me up in little pieces and post me piece by piece to my family. Nevertheless, an Australian judge ordered her children to return to England and, as a loving mother, she went with them. Soon after her return from Australia and just hours after begging the police in England to drive her to a safe house, she was stabbed to death by her ex-partner in front of her children and her own mother. In the days before she was murdered, she was, her mother said, unravelling with fear. And what all of these mothers, and there are many thousands more, have in common is that they've fallen foul of the 1980 Hague Abduction Convention. 
I'm going to play a short video which explains the problem. It's presented by Natalie Anderson, a Hague mother herself who works with us and whose children are currently trapped in Croatia by the Hague. So I'll stop sharing the slides and try to share the video. Hopefully that will work. The 1980 Hague Convention on International Parental Child Abduction was designed to ensure the swift and safe return of children who are taken across international borders by one parent without the other parent's permission. It's usually very effective, but there's a problem. The convention was originally designed to deal with fathers who abduct children and to protect mothers and children, but that's changed. Now, in over 75% of cases, the abducting parent is the mother. Many of them are fleeing domestic abuse. There is nothing that actually protects a fleeing mother and child. No local justice, no international justice, nothing. The convention forces children and therefore mothers to return to the country they have fled. Leaving an abuser is terrifying, fleeing across borders doubly so. Mothers are leaving their homes, their jobs, their friends. They're traumatized and often in fear of their lives. They try to flee to safety and then the Hague Convention hits. Being in court was so terrifying, so stressful that it has left me traumatized. And then they sent my sons back to the man who was beating me raping me. Hague mothers are rarely entitled to legal aid. There are not many specialist lawyers available and they only have a few weeks and sometimes only a few days to prepare their case. The only defence available to them is Article 13b of the Convention. The court does not have to order the return of a child if the mother can prove that there is a grave risk that returning them would expose them to physical or psychological harm or place them in an intolerable situation. But grave risk is interpreted very narrowly. Domestic abuse against the mother is rarely seen as a grave risk or intolerable situation for the child, in spite of extensive evidence to the contrary. Children are almost always returned to the country and often into the care of the abusive parent. My ex has filed a hate convention case against us after we fled Ireland last year. I just know they're going to send my kids back and then I'll have to follow. But what happens to us when we get there? What if he kills us? Mothers must choose whether to return with their children or send them back alone. Those who do return face post-separation abuse, destitution, homelessness, isolation, and sometimes even criminal proceedings. They often have no family and no support networks, a textbook context for continued abuse. It is not in any child's best interest to grow up with a mother who is isolated or unemployed and depressed, trapped in a foreign country by an abusive ex-partner. There has never been a single day when I have felt safe or felt that my children were safe here. We. Oui. Hague mothers aim to end this injustice with the help of international support from lawyers, domestic violence professionals, academics, women's groups, human rights activists, child psychologists, the Hague mothers themselves and the general public. We call on the Hague Secretariat to recognise the grave risk and intolerable situation caused by exposure to domestic abuse. Where domestic abuse is alleged, we ask for the following amendment to the Convention. Legal aid for mothers. A rebuttable presumption of no return. Welfare hearings held in a safe location. The views and wishes of the child to be fully considered. And a restriction on the use of protective measures to defeat Article 13b. are the hate mothers. We're an unstoppable global movement for justice. 
Okay, so as Natalie explained, Eight Mothers was set up to end these injustices. And the injustices I've told you about, the stories I've told you about are quite dramatic ones. But also it can happen that a mother is given permission, for example, to go back to her own country to look after elderly parents. And then suddenly she's hit with a Hague Convention petition and finds herself considered an abductor and the father takes custody of the children. So it can be dramatic or it can be every day. But basically, any mother who is living in a country which is not her home country and who has a child, whether she's married, whether she's separated, whether she's divorced, whether she's ever been uh, married to that father, whether the father's abusive or not, can, can become a victim of the Hague Convention. So the question is, how will we do it? Because it's a pretty impossible task and we intend to do it. We intend to end the injustices through the International Sisterhood. And Janet and Anna are part of that, and thank them very much for being part of that. So we're working uh, in coordination, co-producing this project with approximately 90 women uh, from across the world. Hague mothers, lawyers, domestic violence professionals, academics, journalists, psychiatrists, counselors, feminists, activists, children's rights advocates, and many more. And we're supported, as I mentioned earlier, by the Philia charity, which is a feminist charity based in the UK, but it has a global reach. And here are some of the things we're doing. We decided to focus initially on the UK, the US and Canada and Australia and New Zealand, partly because of the language issue, but partly because those countries have the, the majority of hate cases, both between them, themselves and in general. But as we were set up, we set up about 18 months ago, and so the rest of the world has started to join us. So we now have uh, people working with us from Brazil, from Mexico, from Japan, from Hawaii, from Europe, etc. It's growing and growing because it's a worldwide problem. Here are some of the things we're trying to do. So we're trying to build an evidence base. At the moment, hey, courts don't collect evidence of what happens during or after the court hearing. So anything we tell them, they just say it's anecdotal. So it's really important we start to build that base. So we're going to collect mother's stories, and Janet is part of that enterprise. Uh, we're doing case law analysis, and that's happening in the UK at the moment and will happen further afield, we hope, in the future. And we're collecting statistical evidence so that we can present that evidence in every possible regard, both qualitative and quantitative. We're raising awareness. This is absolutely critical. And later on, I'm going to ask you to help me with that. Once people know, particularly once women know about the Hague Convention, they tend to get involved or they tend to be, tend to be concerned, obviously, because it's such an extraordinary human rights abuse. But we need to let them know. At the moment, it's one of the world's best kept secrets. So we created that video that you've already seen. We're also active on social media. We attend conferences and webinars like this. We write articles. We put pieces in the media. Anything we can do to raise awareness globally of this problem. We're starting to create resources for mothers themselves, for lawyers and for domestic violence professionals. The Hague Convention is an international treaty, but it's slightly different in its um, application in different countries. So we have to tailor those resources for each country. And most importantly, we're lobbying and advocating for change. So we're lobbying governments, we're lobbying the Hague Commission itself, and we're working with the UN, in particular, we're working with the fabulous UN Special Reporter on Violence Against Women and Girls, Reem Al Salam. I don't know if you've come across her, but she is absolutely superb and courageous in her advocacy for women and girls. She recently produced um, a report called Custody, Violence Against Women and Violence Against Children. And it focused particularly on family courts, but it also, for the first time, mentioned The Hague. She said in her recommendations, the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of Child Abduction needs to be revised to better protect abused women and their children by allowing a stronger defence against return if there is family and domestic violence. And it needs to incorporate an understanding that a child's return may compel an abuse survivor to return to violence and harm. Now, for us, that's self-evident, but to have somebody of her stature saying that publicly in a public report is really significant and we're hoping to use that as leverage for further change and we're working closely with her on that. 
Well, so since this is an Australian webinar, I want to tell you about some of the things that are happening in Australia because you are leading the field internationally in these changes. Uh, we inherited an incredibly fertile context in Australia with many thanks to Hague mothers, lawyers and activists who've been lobbying the government and raising awareness way before this campaign ever got going. In particular, her Hague story, Anna was involved as well, and Gina Masterton has been doing sterling work in this regard. So it was a really fertile context. And when we arrived on the scene, uh, you already had a new Australian Attorney General who had committed to safeguarding and supporting mothers in these circumstances. And he started to make steps to do that. So he's... Um, it's produced new leg regulations uh, which will allow domestic violence to be taken into account, even if it's only alleged rather than proven. He's also set up a legal aid option, so that's now available to taking parents, which it wasn't in the past, as well as to the parents who are petitioning for return. And there's been a committee, which many of you will know about, looking into the status of objections by children and children by children, both in family courts and in Hague courts. So we're pushing for more. Instead of domestic violence being allowed to be considered if it's alleged, we want courts to have to consider it. We want it to be a must, not a may. And if domestic violence is proven, then we want everything off the table. There should not be the possibility of bringing a Hague Convention petition if domestic violence is evidenced. Also, the legal aid provision is fantastic, but if the lawyer doesn't understand about, for example, coercive control or the impact of domestic abuse on the child, even if the child is not a witness to it, but just hears about it, then that lawyer is worse than useless. So we're really going to push over the next year or so to make that legal aid provision domestic violence and trauma informed. And also we're pushing for the child's wishes to be fully considered. There is an option within the Hague Convention for child's objections to be heard and, and actually acted on, but it's very seldom used. And in Australia, the regulations make it particularly hard. It has to be a very strong objection from the child. Uh, we put in petitions, we put in submissions to the uh, just Family Law Amendment Bill Committee who are looking at it. And we weren't the only ones to put in submissions in this regard. And they appear to have borne fruit. I heard the day before yesterday that we are able to anticipate that the existing regu regulations will be repealed and the children's voice will be given a much more, will be brought to centre stage, which would be fantastic. We're also co-producing resources for mothers. Uh, it's taking us a bit of time because this entire project is voluntary and there is no uh, funding source, no direct funding source. So it takes time to do things. But once we do them, they're really done well because we have so much expertise at our command. Our huge priority at the moment is to influence the outcome of the eighth special session of the Hague Conference, which meets in October. They only meet once every six years, so this is a really key moment for us, and all our energies are focused on that. So we're doing a number of things. We've written an open letter to the Hague Special Commission, and we're getting it signed by experts in the Hague, people who we think could influence the Hague Special Commission, so the real premier names in the whole Hague world uh, are signing it. So we have uh, over 50 signatures to date and we expect to have about 70 by the time we send that letter in. We're also producing on the other end of the scale, we're producing a booklet of mother's voices with some of the stories, like the stories you just heard this morning and voices of other mothers across the world. And we're going to send that to the Hague Special Commission as well. So they absolutely see, they can't say they don't know what happens when they make these judgments, what the actual outcomes are for mothers and for their children. And there's a lot more we're doing, and that's where I really need your help. I'll put some links in chat at the end of this, and I'd really, really appreciate it if every one of you could help us to make these things happen. So first of all, uh, there's a petition called Protect Hague Victims, an international petition which will be sent to the Hague Commissioners so far, it's had about 34,000 signatures uh, globally, and it would be great if we got that to 40,000 or even 50,000 before it's sent in October to the commissioners. There's a link there. I'll also put it up in chat afterwards, as I say. The petition was started by an organisation called Global Arc, who work with mothers, um, and it's supported by a number of other survivor organisations and by ourselves right across the world. So please 
the end of this, if you could check the link, if you copy the link, if you could sign the petition for us, but then even more important, if one person signs it, that's great. If you can then send it to say 10, family, friends, professionals, colleagues, anybody you know who think I care about this appalling human rights injustice, if you could each get 10 people to sign it and ask them to pass it on, that would make a real difference. And what else would we like you to do? Please share the Time for Change video. That's our key way of getting the information out about the Hague Convention and about our campaign to change it. So share it with anybody you know. Share it with mothers in particular, and certainly mothers who are in abusive relationships or mothers who might need to flee across international borders with lawyers, with DV professionals, with family, with friends. The more people who know about it, the more our voices will become strong. And in particular, please lobby your MPs to push for change. Every country who signed up to the Hague Convention, there are about 102 countries worldwide, sends two representatives to that Hague Commission meeting in October. If we can get if we can petition our MPs to put pressure on those representatives who are generally civil servants so that everybody going to The Hague is at least aware that there are serious and significant human rights problems here, then that will be a, a big difference for us. Normally, The Hague Commission meets and is very um, unwilling to consider the real problems that are happening with The Hague. We need to change that. Please follow us on Twitter. Uh, we're almost at 700 followers. If you all sign up, we'll be at a great deal more. And rather than just following us, if you could retweet, if you could send us information that you thought would be useful for us to retweet, that would be great. Anything to get the word out there. And if you'd like to know more about the project itself, you can sign up for our um, monthly newsletter. And there's the link there. Again, I'll put it in chat. And finally, some of you uh, may have... Um, expertise or experience that you think could help us. Um, if you do, and if you have some time to spare, and I know, I know absolutely that women who would come to these sorts of things are activists and are always very busy, but if you have any time to spare that you think could help us, please email me and join us. And that's it. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Janet and Anne and Bronwyn for inviting me. <laughs>